this report is really responding to the various commitments that have been made over time within the UN and by all its member countries to ad address and eradicate gender inequalities. What this report provides, I think, are, is the rationale for why these commitments should be taken seriously and the losses to both individuals and societies of not taking these commitments seriously. The rationales lie in the evidence that has been compiled very carefully over several decades of research. They tell us that when we equalize, when we promote women's access to economic and financial resources, these are much more likely to be invested in the welfare of the next generation and the education of the next generation. We know that when we, women have access to resources, they are much more likely to be productive. They are like the, the livelihood activities in which they engage are likely to yield higher returns. We know also there are strong microeconomic efficiency arguments that agricultural growth is likely to respond better when women have some say and access to resources about their farms and their firms. And we know there is a macroeconomic efficiency argument as well. And that is cross-country studies, studies over time, all show that gender equality contributes to economic growth, equality in education and equality in labor force participation. But there are reasons for concern, and that is economic growth does not seem to have quite the same positive impacts on gender equality. We do not find quite the same positive story that countries that have higher rates of growth also report progress on women's well-being, their health, uh, and their voice in economic and uh, political decision making. In fact, we know that maternal mortality has remained one of the most intransigent of the MDGs to report progress on. So I think we need to look beyond some of the real gains that women have made in, in the labor market and in education and ask what are the nature of the constraints that continue to keep women uh, within inferior positions in the labor market and therefore dependent on sometimes unreliable husbands sometimes unfair states. We want to develop uh, uh, arguments that will promote women's access to resources so that they have more control over their own lives, so that they are able to negotiate fairer relationships, and so that they can participate in decision making. So, should I end there? Um, so, just to capture very briefly what uh, the report covers, we have looked at all the different areas in which this question of access to resources is important. We have looked at labor markets, employment, and asked what should be done to promote women's progress in the labor market. Not just poor women, but also educated and better off women. And these, these inequalities are not peculiar to poorer countries. We see them in the North as well. We've asked the kinds of training that we need, and we've asked for attention to women's unpaid care responsibilities, because that, to some extent, lies at the heart of the asymmetrical way in which macroeconomic policies are developed, since they only recognize women's paid work. We've also looked at the whole area of natural resources, including land, including water, technology, and uh, housing, and so on. All the different forms of property, private, public, and common property that would enable women to be far more productive in their daily livelihood activities. We've addressed the question of financial services, and we've asked that we go beyond microfinance. Microfinance has played a very important role in overcoming some of the constraints that women have faced in access to financial services. But the, the impact evaluations from microfinance across the world tell us that it is simply not enough to give small amounts of money to women and expect them to become equal players in the market. We need to open up access to the broader financial services, and we need to put far more emphasis on financial services apart from credit. We need to look at insurance, and we need to look at savings. And finally, we have looked at social protection. And this, of course, has taken on a particular urgency in the present time because of the crisis. But social protection is needed in normal times as well. Because risk, vulnerability, and uncertainty are exacerbated by crisis, but they are a part of everyday lives, particularly of poorer people. So we have examined some of the demands, for instance, the ILO is making about a global social floor, 
and we've unpacked the different elements of the floor and asked how can this, these different elements be made more gender sensitive. So that really is, and as Carolyn said, what we've tried to do is show that single interventions on their own don't go very far. What we need is a comprehensive package that looks at the connections between paid and unpaid work, production and reproduction, formal and informal, and north and south.